Chapter 10 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Yearnings for Military Fame. As I could get no one to accept my resignation as corporal, which I tendered after my first service in that capacity, unloading a steamboat, I decided to post myself as to the duties of the position, so I borrowed a copy of Hardy's Tactics and studied a good deal. Every place in the book that mentioned the word corporal had a particular and thrilling interest for me and I soon got so it would have been easy for me to have done almost anything that a corporal would have to do. But I was not contented to study the duty of a corporal. I read about the school of the company, and the school of the regiment, and battalion drills, and everything, until I could handle a regiment or a brigade for that matter, as well as any officer in the army, in my mind. This led me to go farther, and I borrowed a copy of a large blue book the colonel had, the name of which I do not now remember, but it was all military and told how to conduct a battle successfully. I studied that book until I got the thing down so fine that I could have fought the Battle of Gettysburg successfully, and I longed for a chance to show what I knew about military science and strategy. It seemed wonderful to me that one small redhead could contain so much knowledge about military affairs, and I felt a pity for some officers I knew who never had studied at all, and did not know anything except what they had picked up. I fought battles in my mind day and night. Some nights I would lay awake till after midnight, planning campaigns, laying out battlefields, and marching men against the enemy, who fought stubbornly but I always came out victorious, and then I would go to sleep and dream that the President and Secretary of War had got on to me, as it were, and had offered me high positions, and I would wake up in the morning the same red-headed corporal and cook my breakfast. Sometimes I thought it my duty to inform the government in some roundabout way what a bonanza the country had in me, if my talent could only be utilized by placing me where I would have a chance to distinguish myself and bring victory to our arms. I reflected that Grant and Sherman and Sheridan and all the great generals were once corporals, and by study they had risen. There was not one of them that could dream out a battle and a victory any better than I could. All I wanted was a chance, just give me men enough and turn me loose in the southern confederacy with that head of mine, and the result would be all an anxious nation could desire. My first chance came sooner than I expected. The next day a part of the regiment went out on a scout to be gone a couple of days, and my company was along. I was unusually absorbed in thought and wondered if I would be given a chance to do anything. It seemed reasonable that if any corporal was sent out with a squad of men to fight, it would be an old corporal, while if there was any duty that was menial, the new corporals would get it. The second day out we stopped at noon to let our horses rest, when little scouting parties that had been sent out on different roads during the forenoon began to come in. Many of them had picked up straggling rebels and brought them to camp, and they were carefully guarded and the major, who was in command of our party, was asking them questions and pumping them to find out all he could. I went over and looked at them, and they were quite a nice-looking lot of fellows, some being officers with plenty of gold lace on their gray suits. They were home from the Confederate Army on a leave of absence, probably recruiting. After talking with a rebel officer for a time, the major turned to the adjutant and said, send me a corporal and ten men. The adjutant started on, and I followed him. I used to know the adjutant when he taught a district school before the war, and I asked him as a special favor to let me be the corporal. He said the detail would be from my company, and if I could fix it with the orderly sergeant of my company, it was all right. I rushed to my company and found the orderly, and got him to promise that if there was a detail from the company that day, I could go. 
Before the words were out of his mouth, the detail came, and in five minutes I reported to the major with ten men. The major simply told me that a certain rebel captain from Lee's army was reported to be at home, and his plantation was about four miles east, and he described it to me. He told me to ride out there, surround the house, capture the captain, and bring him into camp. No general ever received his orders in regard to fighting a battle with a feeling of greater pride and responsibility than I did my orders to capture that rebel. We started out, and then for the first time I noticed that there was another corporal in the squad with me, and at once it occurred to me that he might claim a part of the glory of capturing the rebel. I had heard of the jealousy existing between generals, and how the partisans of different generals filled the newspapers, after a battle, with accounts of the part taken by their favorites, and that the accounts got so mixed up that the reader couldn't tell to whom the credit of success was due, and I decided to take prompt measure with this supernumerary corporal, who had evidently got in by mistake. So I told him he might go back to the regiment. He said he guessed not. He had been detailed to go on the scout, and he was going, if he knew himself, and he thought he did. He said when it come right down to rank, he was an older corporal than I was, and could take command of the squad if he wanted to. I told him he was mistaken as to his position, that if the major had wanted him to take charge of the expedition, he would have given him the instructions but as the major had given me the instructions in a low tone of voice nobody but myself knew where we were going or what we were going for and that i was responsible and the first intimation i had from him that he wanted to mutiny or relieve me from my command i would have him shot at once i told him he could go along but he must keep his mouth shut and obey orders he said he would obey if he felt like it we moved on, and I would have given a month's pay if that corporal had not been there. In a short time we were in sight of the house, and at a crossroad I told the corporal to take one man and stop there until further orders, and if any rebel came along to capture him. He was willing enough to stay there because there was a patch of musk melons just over the fence. I moved my remaining eight men to a high piece of ground near the house and halted to look over the field of battle. Pulling a spyglass from my pocket, which I had borrowed from the sutler, I surveyed, as near like a general as possible, the situation. On one side of the house was a ravine, which I decided must be held at all hazards, and after studying my copy of tactics a moment, I sent an Irishman over there to hold the key to the situation, and told him he might consider himself the Iron Brigade. The lay of the ground reminded me much of the pictures I had seen of the Battle of Bull Run, and the road on which I had left the corporal and one man was the road to Washington, on which we would retreat, if overcome by the enemy. To the right of the ravine, which was held by the Iron Brigade, I noticed a hen-house with a gate leading back to the nigger quarters, and I called a soldier and told him to make a detour behind a piece of woods, and, at a signal from me, the waving of my right arm, to charge directly to the gate of the hen-house and hold it against any force that might attempt to carry it, and to let no guilty man escape. Fifteen years afterwards General Grant used those self-same words, let no guilty man escape and they became historic. But I will take my oath I was the first commander to use the words when I sent that man to hold the gate of the hen-house. That man I denominated the first division. Farther to the right was a field of sweet potatoes, in which was a colored man digging the potatoes. I sent a Dutchman to hold that field, with a right resting on the left of my first division, located at the gate of the hen-house whose right was supposed to rest on the left of the Iron Brigade, the Irishman who commanded the ravine. Then I turned my attention to the left of the battlefield, placed one man at the milk house with his left resting on the right of the Irishman, and a man at the smoke house. This left three men, one of whom I appointed an aide-de-camp, one an orderly, and the other I held as a reserve at a cotton gin. 
when i had got my army into position i sat under a tree and reflected a little and concluded that the iron brigade was in rather too exposed a position so i sent my aide-de-camp to order the iron brigade to move forward under cover of the ravine and take a position behind a mule shed the aide soon returned and reported that the iron brigade had taken off his shirt and canoodled a negro woman to wash it for him and would not be able to move until the shirt was dry this altered my plans a little but i was equal to the emergency and ordered my reserve to make a detour and take the mule shed and hold it until relieved by the iron brigade which would be as soon as his shirt was dry and then to report to me on the field then i took my aid and orderly and galloped around the lines to see that all was right i found that the first division holding the gate of the hen house was well in hand though he had killed five chickens and had them strapped to his saddle and was trying to cut off the head of another with his sabre he said he thought i said to let no guilty hen escape i found the iron brigade dismounted his shirt hung on a line to dry and the colored woman had been pressed into the federal service and was frying a chicken for the brigade i told him to get his shirt on as soon as it was dry and move by forced marches to relieve the force holding the mule shed and the iron brigade said he would as soon as he had his dinner i found the division composed of the dutchmen stubbornly holding the sweet potato field and he was eating some boiled ham and cornbread he had sent the nigger to the house after and he had a bushel of sweet potatoes in a sack strapped to his saddle the force at the milk house had a fine position and gave me a pitcher of buttermilk which i drank with great gusto i do not know as there is anything in buttermilk that is stimulating but after drinking it my head seemed clearer and i could see the whole battlefield and anticipate each movement i should cause to be made i was so pleased with the buttermilk on the eve of battle that i ordered the second division to fill my canteen with it which he did then i rode back to my headquarters where i started from having ridden clear around the beleaguered plantation presently the reserve returned to me and reported that he had been relieved by the iron brigade at the mule shed whose shirt had become dry and who had given the reserve a leg of fried chicken and a corn dodger i took the leg of chicken away from my reserve ate it with great relish and prepared for the onslaught the reserve picking some persimmons off a tree and eating them for lunch i was about to order the different divisions and brigades of my army to advance from their different positions and close in on the enemy when a colored man came out of the house and moved toward me signaling that he would fain converse with me i struck a dignified attitude by throwing my right leg over the pommel of the saddle like a hired girl riding a plough horse to town after a doctor and waited when he came up to me he said massa wants to know what all dis darn foolishness is about he says if you all don't go away from here he will shoot de liver out in you all i told the negro to be calm and not cause me to resort to extreme measures and i asked him if his master was at home he said he was and he was a bad man with a gun he had killed plenty of men before the war and since the war he had killed more yankees than enough to build a rail fence around the plantation i did not exactly like the reports in regard to the enemy i told the colored man to take a flag of truce to his master and tell him i would like an interview the colored man went to the house and i sent for the iron brigade to report to me at once in light marching order and the irishman came riding up without any shirt on i caused the brigade to put on his shirt when i sent him to the house to follow the flag of truce and feel of the enemy he went to the house and was evidently invited in for he disappeared i waited half an hour for him and as he did not show up i called the second division and sent the dutchman to the house the second division went in and did not come out i ordered the whole right wing of my army to deploy to my support and the fellow at the hen-house gate came and i sent him in after the irishman and the dutchman he didn't come back and i sent an orderly after the force stationed at the milk-house and he came and i sent him with the same result 
it was evident i was frittering away my command with no good result so i looked at my tactics and decided to hold a council of war my aide orderly and reserve three besides myself composed the council of war the three were in favor of ordering up the other corporal and man from the crossroads but i opposed it i did not want the other corporal to have any finger in the pie so i decided that the four of us would go in a body to the house and demand the surrender of the rebel captain we rode down the lane where the other men had gone and it was a question whether we ever came back alive i thought they had a trap door in the house which probably let the soldiers down suddenly into a dungeon certainly unless there was something of the kind my men would have come back as we dismounted at the door and walked up the steps the door opened and a fine-looking rebel officer appeared smiling come in captain with your men and join me in a glass of wine said the rebel i had never been called captain before and it touched me in a tender spot the rebel evidently thought i looked like a captain and i was proud he had probably watched my maneuvers and the way i handled my men and thought i was no common soldier well i don't care if i do said i and we walked into a splendid old room and were bidden to be seated hello corp said my iron brigade as he took his legs down from a table and poured out a glass of whiskey from a bottle near him this is the devil's own place for an easy life corporal said my dutch fellow-soldier as he poured out a glass of schnapps let me introduce you mit dat rebel he is a daisy und don't you forget about it mr rebel dat ish der corporal from my gumpany the rebel smiled and said he was glad to see me and hoped i was well and would i take wine or something stronger i took a small glass of wine but the rest of the fellows took strong drink and my iron brigade was already full and the dutchman was getting full rapidly finally i told the rebel officer that i did not like to accept a man's hospitality when i had such an unpleasant duty to perform as to arrest him but circumstances seemed to make it necessary he said that was all right in times of war we must do many things that were unpleasant we took another drink and then i told him i was sorry to inconvenience him but he would have to accompany me to camp he said certainly he had expected to be captured ever since he saw that the house was surrounded and while at first he had made up his mind to take his rifle and kill us all from the gallery of the house he had thought better of it and would surrender without bloodshed what was the use of killing any more men the war was nearly over and why not submit and save carnage i told him that was the way i felt about it then he said if i would wait until he retired to an adjoining room and changed his linen he would be ready i said of course certainly and he went out of a door i waited about half an hour until it seemed to me the rebel had had time to change all the linen in the state of alabama the iron brigade had gone to sleep on a lounge and the german troop was as full as a goat and some of the others were beginning to feel the hospitality i beg your pardon for intruding said i as i opened the door and walked into the room the rebel had entered great scott he is gone my army all except the iron brigade and the dutchman followed me and the room was empty a window was up through which he had escaped we searched the house but there was no rebel captain on going to the front door i found that the horse belonging to the iron brigade was gone and that the saddle girths of all the other horses had been unbuckled so we would be delayed in following him the irishman was awakened and when he found his horse was gone he sobered up and went to the pasture and borrowed a mule to ride it took us half an hour to fix our saddles so we could ride and then we sadly started for camp how could i face the major and report to him that i had met the rebel captain talked with him drank with him enjoyed his hospitality and then let him escape i felt that my military career had come to an inglorious ending we rode slow because the iron brigade was insecurely mounted on a slippery bareback mule 
as we neared the corporal and one man that i had left to guard the crossroads i noticed that there was a stranger with them and on riding closer what was my surprise to find that it was the rebel captain under arrest so the confounded corporal whom i had left there so he would be out of the way and not get any of the glory of capturing the rebel had captured him and got all the glory i was hurt but putting on a bold military air like a general who has been whipped i said ah corporal i see my plan has worked successfully i arranged it so this prisoner would run right into the trap yes said the corporal throwing away a melon rind that he had been chewing the meat off of i saw his nibs coming down the road and i thought maybe he was the one you wanted so i told him to halt or i would fill his lungs full of lead pills and he said he guessed he would halt he said it was a nice day and he was only trying one of the yankee cavalry horses to see how he liked it here you murderin devil get down off that horse said the iron brigade who had got awake enough to see that the rebel was on his horse take this mule and lave a decent gentleman's horse alone the rebel smiled dismounted gave the irishman his horse mounted the mule and we started for camp i was never so elated in my life as i was when i rode into camp with that rebel captain beside me on the mule the object of the expedition had been accomplished a little different it is true from what i had expected and planned but who knew that it was not a part of my plan to have it turn out as it did i reflected much and wondered if it was right for me to report the capture of the confederate and say nothing about the part played by the other corporal that corporal was no military strategist like me it was just a streak of luck his capturing the rebel he was leaning against the fence where i left him eating melons and the rebel came along and the corporal quit chewing melon long enough to obey my orders and arrest the fellow by all the rules of military law i was entitled to the credit and i would take it though it made me ashamed to do so however generals did the same thing if a major general was in command and ordered a brigadier general to do a thing and it was a success the major general got the credit in the newspapers so i rode into camp and turned my prisoner over to the major as modestly as possible with a few words of praise of my gallant command hello jim said the major to the rebel hello Maj," said the rebel better take off them togs now and join your company said the major i guess so said the rebel and he took off his rebel uniform and the major handed him a blue coat and a pair of pants and he put them on i was petrified the fact was the rebel was a sergeant in our regiment who had been detailed as a scout and had been making a trip into the rebel lines as a spy i had made an ass of myself and the whole business and he would tell all the boys about it i went back to my company crushed End of chapter 10 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 11 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 I Am Detailed to Build a Bridge after the episode related last week in which i foolishly organized a regular battle to capture a supposed rebel who turned out to be a member of my own regiment i expected to be the laughing-stock of all the soldiers and that my commission as corporal would be taken away from me and that i would be reduced to the ranks and when the next morning the colonel sent for me to come to his tent it was a standoff with me whether i would take to the woods and desert in disgrace and never show up again or go to the colonel face the music and admit that i had made an ass of myself finally i decided to visit the colonel on the way to his tent i noticed that our force had been augmented greatly the road was full of wagons the fields near us were filled with infantry and artillery and there were fifty wagons or more loaded with pontoons great boats or the framework of boats 
which were to be covered with canvas which was for waterproof and the boats were to be used for bridges across streams the colonel had not told me anything about the expected arrival of more troops and it worried me a good deal maybe there was a big battle coming off and i might blunder into it unconscious of danger and get the liver blowed out of me by a cannon i felt that the colonel had not treated me right in keeping me in ignorance of all this preparation i went to the colonel's tent and there was quite a crowd of officers some with artillery uniforms several colonels and one general with a star on his shoulder straps and a crooked sword with a silver scabbard covered with gold trimmings i felt quite small with those big officers but i tried to look brave and as though i was accustomed to attending councils of war the colonel smiled at me as i came in which braced me up a good deal general this is the sergeant i spoke to you about said the colonel as he turned from a map they had been looking at i felt pale when the colonel addressed me as sergeant and was going to call his attention to the mistake when the general said sergeant the colonel tells me that you can turn your hand to almost anything what line of business have you worked at previous to your enlistment well i guess there is nothing that is usually done in a country village that i have not done i have clerked in a grocery tended bar drove team on a threshing machine worked in a slaughterhouse drove omnibus worked in a sawmill learned the printing trade rode saw logs worked in a pinery been brakeman on a freight train acted as assistant chambermaid in a livery stable clerked in a hotel worked on a farm been an auctioneer edited a newspaper took up the collection in church canvassed for books been life insurance agent worked at bridge building took tin types sat on a jury been constable been deckhand on a steamboat chopped cordwood run a cider mill and drove a stallion in a four-minute race at a county fair that will do said the general you will be placed in charge of a pioneer corps and you will go four miles south on the road where a bridge has been destroyed across a small bayou build a new bridge strong enough to cross artillery then move on two miles to a river you will find and look out for a good place to throw a pontoon bridge across the first bridge you will build under an artillery fire from the rebels and when it is done let a squad of cavalry cross then the pontoon train and a regiment of infantry then light out for the river ahead of the pontoon train with the cavalry the pioneer corps will be ready in fifteen minutes the colonel told me to hurry up but i called him out of his tent and asked him if i was really a sergeant or if it was a mirage he said if i made a success of that bridge and the command got across and i was not killed i would be appointed sergeant he said the general would try me as a bridge builder and if i was a success he would try me no doubt in other capacities such as driving team on a threshing machine and editing a newspaper well i went on after my horse being pretty proud the idea of being picked out of so many non-commissioned officers and placed in charge of a pioneer corps and sent ahead of the army to rebuild a bridge that had been destroyed with a prospect of being promoted or killed was glory enough for one day and i rode back to headquarters feeling that the success of the whole expedition rested on me if i built a corduroy bridge that would pass that whole army safely over artillery and all would anybody inquire who built the bridge of course if i built a bridge that would break down and drown somebody everybody would know who built it the twenty men were mounted and ready and the general told me to go to the quartermaster and get all the tools i wanted and i took twenty axes ten shovels two log chains and was riding away when the general said when you get there and look the ground over make up your mind exactly at what hour and minute you can have the bridge completed and send a courier back to inform me and at that hour the head of the column will be there and the bridge must be ready to cross on i said that would be all right and we started out in about forty minutes we had arrived at the bayou and i called a private soldier who used to do logging in the woods and we looked the thing over the timber necessary was right on the bank of the stream jim i said to the private 
I have got to build a bridge across this stream strong enough to cross artillery. I shall report to the general that he can send along his artillery at seventeen minutes after eight o'clock this evening. Am I right? Well, said Jim, as he looked at the standing timber, at the stream, and spit some black tobacco juice down on the red ground, I should make it thirty-seven minutes after eight. You see, a shell may drop in here and kill a mule or something and delay us. Make it thirty-seven and I will go you. We finally compromised by splitting the difference, and I sent a courier back to the general with my compliments, and with the information that at precisely eight o'clock and twenty-seven minutes he could start across. Then we fell to work. Large long trees were cut for stringers, and hewn square. Posts were made to prop up the stringers, though the stringers would have held any weight. Then small trees were cut and flattened on two sides for the roadbed, holes bored in them, and pegs made to drive through them into the stringers. A lot of cavalry soldiers never worked as those men did. Though there was only twenty of them, it seemed as though the woods were full of men. Trees were falling and axes resounding, and men yelling at mules that were hauling logs, and the scene reminded me of logging in the Wisconsin pineries, only these men were in uniform doing the work. About the middle of the afternoon we had the stringers across, when there was a half a dozen shots heard down the stream, and bullets began zipping all around the bridge, and we knew the rebels were on to the scheme and wanted it stopped. I got behind a tree when the bullets began to come, to think it over. My first impulse was to leave the bridge and go back and tell the general that I couldn't build no bridge unless everything was quiet, that I had never built bridges where people objected to it. I asked the private what we had better do. He said his idea was to knock off work on the bridge for just fifteen minutes, cross the stream on the stringers, and go down there in the woods and scare the life out of those rebels, drive them away, and make them think the whole army was after them then cross back and finish the bridge. That seemed feasible enough, so about a dozen of us squirreled across the stringers with our carbines, and the rest went down the stream on our side, and all of us fired a dozen rounds from our Spencer repeaters right into the woods where the rebels seemed to be. When we did so, the rebels must have thought there was a million of us, for they scattered too quick, and we had a quiet life for two hours. We had got the bridge nearly completed when there was a hissing sound in the air, a streak of smoke, and a powder magazine seemed to explode right over us. I suppose I turned pale, for I had never heard anything like it. Says I, Jim, excuse me, but what kind of a thing is that? Jim kept on at work, remarking, Oh, nothing, only they are shelling on us. And so that was a shell. I had read of shells and seen pictures of them in Harper's Weekly, but I never supposed I would hear one. Presently another came, and I wanted to pack up and go away. I looked at my pioneers, and they did not pay any more attention to the shells than they would to the braying of mules. I asked Jim if there wasn't more or less danger attached to the building of bridges in the South, and he, the old veteran, said, Corp, don't worry, as long as they hain't got our range, their mare shell are going half a mile beyond us, and we don't need to worry. Just let them think they are killing us off by the dozen, and they will keep on sending shells right over us. If we had a battery here to shell back, they would get our range and make it pretty warm for us. But now it is all guesswork with them, and we are as safe as we would be in Oshkosh. Let's keep right on with the bridge. I can never explain what a comfort Jim's remarks were to me. After listening to him, I could work right along, driving pegs in the bridge, and pay no attention to the shells that were going over us. In fact, I lit my pipe and smoked and began to figure out how much it was going to cost the Confederacy to celebrate that way. It was costing them at the rate of fourteen dollars a minute, and I actually found myself laughing at the good joke on the rebels. Pretty soon a courier rode up from the general, asking if the shelling was delaying the bridge. I sent word back that it was not delaying us in the least. In fact, it was hurrying us a little, if anything, and he could send along his command twenty-seven minutes sooner than I had calculated, as the bridge would be ready to cross on at eight o'clock sharp. At a quarter to eight, just as the daylight was fading and we had lighted pine torches to see to eat our supper, 
an orderly rode up and said the general and staff had been looking for me for an hour and were down at the forks of the road i told the orderly to bring the general and staff right up to the headquarters and we would entertain them to the best of our ability and he rode off then we sat down under a tree and smoked and played seven up by the light of pine torches and waited i was never so proud of anything in my life as i was of that bridge and it did not seem to me as though a promotion to the position of sergeant was going to be sufficient recompense for that great feat of engineering it was as smooth as though sawed plank had covered it and logs were laid on each side to keep wagons from running off i could see in my mind hundreds of wagons and thousands of soldiers crossing safely and i would be a hero my breast swelled so my coat was too tight presently i heard some one swearing down the road the clanking of sabres and in a few moments the general rode into the glare of the torchlight i had struck an attitude at the approach of the bridge and thought that i would give a good deal if an artist could take a picture of my bridge with me the great engineer standing upon it and the head of the column just ready to cross i was just getting ready to make a little speech to the general presenting the bridge to him as trustee of the nation for the use of the army when i got a sight of his face as a torch flared up and lit the surroundings it was pale and if he was not a madman i never saw one he fairly frothed at the mouth as he said addressing a soldier who had fallen in the stream during the afternoon and who was putting on his shirt which he had dried by a fire where is the corporal the star idiot who built that bridge i couldn't have been more surprised if he had killed me this was a nice way to inquire for a gentleman who had done as much for the country as i had in so short a time i felt hurt but summoning to my aid all the gall i possessed i stepped forward and in as sarcastic a manner as i could assume i said i am the sergeant sir who has wrought this work made a highway in twelve hours across a torrent and made it possible for your army to cross well what do you suppose my army wants to cross this confounded ditch for what business has the army got in that swamp over there you have gone off the main road where i wanted a bridge built and built one on a private road to a plantation where nobody wants to cross this bridge is of no more use to me than a bridge across the mississippi river at its source you sir have just simply raised hell that's what you have done talk about being crushed i was pulverized i felt like jumping into the stream and drowning myself for a moment i could not speak because i hadn't anything to say then i thought that it would be pretty tough to go and leave that bridge without the general seeing what a good job it was so i said well general i am sorry you did not give me more explicit instructions but i wish you would get down and examine this bridge it is a daisy and if it is not in the right place we can move it anywhere you want it that seemed to give the general an idea and he dismounted and examined it he said it was as good a job as he ever saw and if it was a mile down the road across another bayou where he wanted to cross he would give a fortune i told him if he would give me men enough and wagons enough i would move it to where he wanted it and have it ready by daylight the next morning he agreed and that was the hardest night's work i ever did every stick of timber in my pet bridge had to be taken off separately and moved over a mile but it was done and at daylight the next morning i had the pleasure of calling the general and telling him that the bridge was ready i thought he was a little mean when he woke up and rubbed his eyes and said now you are sure you have got it in the right place this time for if that bridge has strayed away on to anybody's plantation this time you die the army crossed all right and i had the proud pleasure of standing by the bridge until the last man was across when i rode up to my regiment and reported to the colonel pretty tired footnote a few weeks ago i met a member of my old regiment who was travelling through the south as agent for a beer bottling establishment in the north he was with me when we built the corduroy bridge twenty-two years ago as we were talking over old times he asked me if i remembered that bridge we built one day in alabama in the wrong place and moved it during the night i told him i wished i had as many dollars as i remembered that bridge well said my comrade 
on my last trip through alabama i crossed that bridge and paid two bits for the privilege of crossing a man has established a toll-gate at the bridge and they say he has made a fortune i asked him how much his bridge cost him and he said it didn't cost him a cent as the yankees built it during the war he said they cut the timber on his land and when he got out of the confederate army he was busted and he claimed the bridge and got a charter to keep a toll-gate my comrade added that the bridge was as sound as it was when it was built he said he asked the toll-gate keeper if he knew the bridge was first built a mile away and he said he knew the timber was cut up there and he wondered what the confounded yankees went away off there to cut the timber for when they could get it right off the bank then my comrade told the toll-gate keeper that he helped build the bridge the rebel thanked him and wanted to pay back the two bits some day i am going down to alabama and cross on that bridge again the bridge that almost caused me to commit suicide and if that old rebel for he must be an old rebel now charges me the two bits toll i shall very likely pull off my coat and let him whip me and then as likely as not there will be another war End of footnote. he was superintending the laying of a pontoon bridge across a large river a few miles from my bridge and he said george the general was pretty hot last night but he was to blame about the mistake in the location and he says he is going to try and get you a commission as lieutenant i felt faint but i said how can he recommend a star idiot for a commissioned office oh that is all right said the colonel some of the greatest idiots in the army have received commissions as he spoke the rebels began to shell the place where the pontoon bridge was being built and i went hunting for a place to borrow an umbrella to hold over me to ward off the pieces of shell then a battery of our own opened on the rebels so near me that every time a gun was discharged i could feel the roof of my head raise up like the cover to a bandbox it was the wildest time i ever saw cavalry was swimming the river to charge the rebel battery shells were exploding all around and it seemed to me as though if i was to lay a pontoon bridge i would go off somewhere out of the way where it would be quiet finally my regiment was ordered to swim the river and we rode in the first lunge my horse made he went under water about a mile and when we came up i was not on him but catching hold of his tail i was dragged across the river nearly drowned and landed on the bank like a dog that has been after a duck i shook myself we mounted and without waiting to dry out our clothes we went into the fight before i could realize it or back out scared i was so scared it is a wonder i did not die that was more excitement than a county fair bullets whizzing shells shrieking smoke stifling yelling that was deafening it seemed as though i was crazy i must have been or i could never as a raw recruit with no experience have ridden right toward those guns that were belching forth sulphur and pieces of blacksmith shop i didn't dare look anywhere except right ahead all thought of being hit by bullets or anything was completely out of my mind occasionally something would go over me that sounded as though a buzz saw had been fired from a sawmill explosion presently the firing on the rebel side ceased and it was seen that they were in retreat i was never so glad of anything in my life we stopped and i examined my clothes and they were perfectly dry the excitement and warmth of the body had acted like a drying room in a laundry then i laid down under a fence and went to sleep and dreamed i was in hades building a corduroy bridge across the sticks and that the devil reprimanded me for building it in the wrong place when i awoke i was so stiff with rheumatism that i had to be helped up from under the fence and they put me in an ambulance with a soldier who had his jaw shot off he was not good company because i had to do all the talking and in that way we moved towards the enemy end of chapter eleven recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter twelve of how private george w peck put down the rebellion by george wilbur peck this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve i am instructed to capture and search a female smuggler 
it was at this time that the hardest duty that it was my lot to perform during my service fell to me and the only wonder to me is that i am alive to-day to tell of it if i ever get a pension it will be on account of night sweats caused by the terrible and trying work that was assigned to me one day the colonel sent for me and i knew at once that there was something unusual in the wind after seating myself in his tent he opened the subject by asking me if i wasn't something of a hand to be agreeable to the ladies i told him with many blushes that if there was one thing on this earth that i thought was nicer than everything else it was a lady and that a good woman was the noblest work of god he said he was on to all of that but it wasn't a good woman that he was after that startled me a little i had heard the officers had a habit of fooling around a good deal with certain females and i told the colonel that any duty that i was assigned to i would perform to the best of my poor ability but i could not go around with the girls as officers did because i couldn't afford it and it was against my principles anyway he showed me a picture of a beautiful woman and asked me if i would know her if i saw her again i told him i could pick her out of a thousand he said she was a smuggler she had a pass from a general who seemed to be under her influence to a certain extent for some reason and went in and out of the lines freely the general didn't want to order her arrest because she would squeal on him but he wanted her arrested all the same and the idea was to have some corporal in charge of a picket post take the responsibility of arresting her without orders refuse to recognize her pass take the quinine and other medicines and money away from her and then be arrested himself for exceeding his authority he said they wanted a corporal who had every appearance of being a big-headed idiot and yet who knew what he was about who knew something about women and who could do such a job up in shape and never let the woman know that the general or anybody had anything to do with her arrest the idea was to catch her in the act of smuggling quinine through the lines to the rebels by the act of a fresh corporal who took the matter into his own hands and who claimed that the pass she had from the general was a forgery when the general could when the woman was brought before him be indignant at the corporal for insulting a woman and order him arrested and he could also go back on the woman and have her sent away after which he would release the corporal and perhaps promote him and all would be well it was as pretty a scheme as i ever listened to and i consented to do the duty though i wouldn't do it again for a million dollars the colonel told me to take four men and go to a particular place on an unfrequented road near a schoolhouse and put out a picket the female would be along during the afternoon on horseback and when she showed her pass one of the men must take hold of her horse and hold him while i kicked about the pass made her dismount and searched her for quinine i turned ashy pale when the colonel said that and i said to him colonel for heaven's sake don't compel me to search a woman i have a family at home and they will hear of it my political enemies will use it against me at home when i run for office after the war let me bring her here to your tent and you search her no that would spoil all said the colonel we want her searched right there at the little schoolhouse by a corporal without apparent authority and every last quinine pill taken off of her if she was brought here she would cry and rave and we should weaken because we know her and have been entertained at her house you are supposed to be a heartless corporal with no sentiment no mercy no nothing just a delver after smuggled quinine besides i too have a family and i don't want to search no females by the way one of the general's staff saw her last night and drew the cartridges from her revolver and put in some blank cartridges if the worst comes she will draw her revolver on you and perhaps fire at you but there are no balls in her revolver so you needn't be afraid but suppose she has two revolvers i asked and one is loaded with bullets i don't think she has said the colonel but we have to take some chances you know now go right along 
treat her like a lady, disbelieve everything she says, and insist on searching her. The general says she wears an enormous bustle, and probably that is full of quinine. Use your judgment, but get it all. Pretend to be an ignorant sort of a corporal who feels that the success of the war depends on him. Act as though you outrank the general, and tell her you would not let her pass with that quinine if the general himself was present. Just display plenty gall, and when you have got the quinine, bring the girl here, and I will abuse you, and you will take it like a little man, and all will be well. If she bites and scratches some, you will have to hold her, but the best way will be to argue with her and persuade her by honeyed words to come down with the quinine. Go. One word, Colonel, before I go, I said. About how many men should you think it would take to hold this woman? You suggested three, but if one holds her horse, it seems to me from my knowledge of female kicking, biting, and scratching, that I would need one man for each arm and foot, one to hold her head and choke her, if necessary, and one with a roving commission to work around where he would be apt to make himself useful. What do you say if I take five men? All right, take six, said the colonel. One may be disabled, or have his jaw kicked off, or something but don't detail anybody to search her. Do that yourself, and do it like a gentleman. And above all things, do not let her canoodle you with soft words and looks of love, because she is full of them. If she can't scare you with her indignation at the outrage of arresting and searching her, she will try to capture you and make you love her. You must be as firm as adamant. Now hurry up. I picked out six men, four of whom were young Americans, rather handsome, and very polite, regular mashers. Then I had an Irishman named Duffy, and a German named Holtzmeyer, who was a butcher. We went out on the road to the schoolhouse, and I put the Irishman on picket, and instructed the German about taking the horse by the bridle at the proper time. Then the rest of us got behind the schoolhouse and waited. For two hours we waited and I had a chance to think over the situation. Here I was, putting down the rebellion, laying for a woman who was loaded. At home I was a polite man, and full of fun, a person any lady might be proud to meet and talk with, but here I was expected to do something for thirteen dollars a month to put down the rebellion, which there was not money enough in the whole state of Wisconsin to hire me to do. Was it such a crime to carry a little quinine to a sick friend? Suppose a rebel was sick with ague, and I had quinine. Would I see him shake himself out of his boots and not give him medicine? No, I would divide my last quinine powder with him. So would any soldier. If it was not treason to give one rebel a quinine powder when he was sick, why should it be treason to take along enough for a whole lot of sick rebels? Did our government want to put down the rebellion by keeping medicines away from a sick enemy? Were we to gloat over the number of rebels who died of disease that we could save by sending them medicines? It seemed to me if I was in command of the army, instead of arresting women for carrying medicine to their sick brothers, I would load up a wagon with medicine and send it to them, and say, Here, you fellows, fire this quinine down your necks and get well and then, if you want to fight any more, come out on the field, and we will give you the best turn in the wheelhouse. It seemed to me that would be the way to win the enemy over, and that they would be thankful, take the medicine, get well, and then say, Boys, these Yankees are pretty good fellows after all. Let's quit fighting and call it quits. But I was not running the war, and had got to obey orders if I broke heart-strings and corset-strings. I would have given anything to have got out of the job. The idea of arresting a woman and searching her and seeing her cry and have her think me a hard-hearted wretch was revolting, and I found myself wishing she would take some other road. Maybe she looked like somebody that I knew at home, and maybe she had a big brother in the Confederate Army who would look me up after the war and everlastingly maul the life out of me for insulting his sister. I made up my mind if anything of that kind happened I would tell on the general and the colonel, and get them whipped too. 
Fat the devil is coming, said the Irishman. Corporal of the guard, the queen of all the south is coming down the road riding a high stepper. Fat will I do, I do know. Stop her, I yelled with my teeth chattering. Halt right, here yous are, said the Irishman, with a look on his face that showed he was, well, that he was an Irishman, and had an eye for beauty. The German had taken the horse by the bit, and I stepped out from behind the schoolhouse. Great heavens, but she was a beautiful woman, and she sat on her horse like a statue. I had never seen a more beautiful woman. She was a brunette with large black eyes, and her face was flushed with the exercise of riding. She smiled and showed two rows of the prettiest teeth that ever were put into a female mouth and one ungloved hand, with which she handed me the pass, had a dimple at every knuckle, and was as white as paper and soft as silk. I know it was soft because it touched my red, freckled hand when I took the pass. I did not blame the general for being in love with her, or for wanting to saw off the unpleasant duty of breaking up her smuggling onto a poor orphan like me. She said, "'Captain?' I have a pass from the general to go through the lines at any time, unmolested. It is no good, I said, examining it. This pass is evidently a forgery. But my dear captain, she said with a smile that I would give ten dollars for a picture of, the pass is not a forgery. I have used it for months. I am not a dear captain, only a cheap corporal, I said, with an attempt to be at my ease which I wasn't. There has been at least a wagon load of quinine smuggled through the lines on this pass, and it has got to stop. You cannot go. The dickens, you say, said she, as she drew her revolver and sung out, let go that horse, and firing at the German. Great stunnerwetter, said the German, as he got down by the horse's forefeet and held on to the bridle. What for you chew a man when he hold your horse? madam i said your revolver is loaded with blank cartridges and you can do no harm try another one on the irishman hold on said the irishman and don't experiment on a poor man who has a wife and six children shoot the corporal but i had reached up and taken the revolver from her and she was as weak as a kitten her nerve had forsaken her and when i told her to dismount she was like a rag and had to be helped down if she was beautiful before, now that she had started her tear mill, she was ravishingly radiant, and I felt like a villain. She leaned on my shoulder, and it was the loveliest burden a soldier ever held. I seated her on the steps of the schoolhouse, and I thought she would faint, but she didn't. She was evidently taken by surprise, and wanted a little time to think it over and form a plan. So did I as i looked her over and thought what i was expected to do i wondered where it would be best to commence she began to recover smiled at me and asked me to have the other soldiers go away so she could talk with me i wished she wouldn't smile like that because it unnerved me she asked me what i was going to do with her what caused me to suspect her if i would not believe her if she told me she was not a smuggler if i had orders to arrest her and all that i said madam my orders are to arrest all quinine smugglers and you are one i am hawkshaw the detective for months i have shadowed you and i know you have concealed about your person a whole drug store in that innocent looking bustle i feel that there is quinine for the million your heaving bosom contains besides love for your friends and hatred of your enemies a storehouse of useful medicines contraband of war in your stockings there is much that would interest the seeker after the truth your corset that fits you so beautifully is liable to be full of revolver cartridges while in your shoes there may be messages to the rebels i shall search you from genesis to revelations and may the lord have mercy on both of us to begin please let me examine the hat you have on with some reluctance she took off a sort of half stovepipe hat and covered her face with her handkerchief while i looked into it i found a package of newly printed confederate bonds and a quantity of court plaster that settled it 
she cried a little and wanted to go into the schoolhouse i went in with her and two of my soldiers i told her that it was a duty that was pretty tough but it was necessary for her to disrobe as i must have every article she had she cried and said if i searched her or molested her i would do it at my peril and that i wouldn't know how to go to work to take off her clothes anyway and that i ought to be ashamed of myself i told her i felt as ashamed as any gentleman could and though i knew little about the details of the female apparel i had some general ideas about bustles polonaise socks skirts and so forth and while i might be awkward and uncouth and nervous as long as there were buttons to unbutton hooks to unhook and safety pins to unpin i thought i could eventually get to the quinine if she would give me time and i did not faint by the wayside but my idea was that it would save all trouble her modesty would not receive a shock nor mine either if she would go behind the little pulpit in the schoolhouse out of sight of us take off her clothes and hand them over the pulpit to us to examine she said she would die first besides she knew we would peek around the pulpit at her i was getting very nervous and perspiring a good deal and wishing it was over and i swore upon my honor that if she would go behind the pulpit and disrobe she should be as safe from intrusion as though she was in her own room she swore she would not and i went up to her to commence unraveling the mystery her dress hooked up in the back which i always did think a great nuisance and i began to unhook it i wondered that she stood so quietly and let me unhook it but after it was unhooked from the neck to the small of her back and i was wishing i was dead she said there now that you have got my dress unhooked a feat i could never accomplish myself i will go behind the pulpit and take off my dress if you will promise not to look and that you will help me hook up my dress when this cruel quinine war is over i told her by the great jehoshaphat and the continental congress i would help her and that i would kill anybody who looked and she went behind the schoolhouse pulpit where a country preacher very likely preached on sundays and bent over out of sight and it wasn't half a minute before she handed the dress over to me in the pockets i found several papers of some kind of medicine and a few small bottles sealed up with red sealing wax now the bustle please i said in a voice trembling with emotion take your old bustle she said as she whacked it on the top of the pulpit well if anybody had told me that a bustle could be made to hold stuff enough to fill a bushel basket i would not have believed it we filled three nose bags such as cavalrymen feed horses in with paper packages and bottles of quinine there were thirty bottles of pills and salves and ointments and plasters this is panning out first rate i said with less emotion the emotion was somehow getting out of me and the affair was becoming more of a mercantile transaction it was like a young druggist going from the side of his beloved to the country store to take an inventory now hand out that other lot she evidently knew what i referred to for she handed out over the pulpit a package just exactly the shape of what i had supposed in my guileless innocence was a portion of the female form that is i had suspected it was not all human form but didn't know that was also full of medicines of which quinine was the larger part although there was about a pint of gun caps speaking about stockings i said please take them off and hand them over she kicked about taking off her shoes and stockings and said no gentleman would compel a lady to do that i said i would wait about two minutes and then if it was too much trouble for her to take them off i would come around the pulpit and help bless you i wouldn't have gone for the world as i was already more than satisfied with what i had found she said i needn't trouble myself for she guessed she could take off her shoes without my help i heard her unlacing her shoes and pretty soon two dainty shoes and two very long stockings came over the pulpit the heel of one shoe hitting me in the ear as i picked up the shoes i heard the crumpling of a letter behind the pulpit and i told her i must have all the messages she had she said it was only a letter to one she loved i told her i must have it and she handed it over and i read 
my darling husband and handed it back saying i would not pry into her family secrets she began to cry and insisted on my reading it which i did it was to her husband an officer in the confederate army and was about as follows my darling husband this life of deception is killing me i want to do all in my power to help our cause but i am each day more nervous and liable to detection the yankee officers are frequently at our house and i have to treat them kindly but it is all i can do to keep from crying and i am expected to laugh i fear that i am suspected of smuggling as the subject is frequently brought up in conversation and i feel my face burn though i try hard not to show it think of you away off in virginia with your armless sleeve our children in new orleans and i wonder if we will ever be united again oh god when will all this end i have no fault to find with the federal troops the officers are very kind and through one fatherly general i am allowed to pass into our lines i feel that i am betraying his kindness every trip i make and only the urgent need that our dear boys have for medicines could induce me to do as i do after this trip i shall go to new orleans where i fear madge is sick as she show not at all well the last i heard from her pray earnestly my dear husband every day as i do that this trouble may end soon some way and i beg of you not to have a feeling of revenge in your heart towards your enemies on account of the loss of your arm as there are thousands of federals similarly afflicted i shall love you more and i will wrap your empty sleeve about my neck and try never to miss the strong arm that was my support adieu your loving wife that letter knocked me out in one round i had begun to enjoy the unpacking of the smuggled goods and the discomfiture of my female smuggler but when i read that loving letter breathing such a christian spirit and thought of the poor wife mother behind the pulpit unraveling herself i was ashamed and i said to myself she shall not take off another rag so i handed back the letter and the dress and all of the things she had taken off and i said put everything right back onto yourself and come out at your leisure and we took the medicines and went out of the schoolhouse presently she came out and i told her it was my duty to take her back to headquarters but if she had no objections to my taking the letter to the general with the medicines she could go back to the house where she boarded and i thought if she took the first boat for new orleans it would be all right and i would see that the letter was sent through the lines to her husband i helped her on her horse and i said you can escape your horse is better than ours and though you are a prisoner we would not shoot at you if you tried to escape i hope your prayers will have the effect you desire and that the trouble will soon be over i hope you will and the children well and that the husband will be spared to be a comfort to you she bowed her head as she sat in the saddle and the look of defiance which she had shown was gone and one of thankfulness peace hope purity took its place she handed me the letter and asked can i go i told her she was free to go she turned her horse toward town touched him with a whip and he was away like the wind i stood for two minutes watching her when i was recalled to my senses by the irishman who said what are we to do with the quinine and the gun caps we packed the smuggled goods in our saddle bags and elsewhere and rode back to headquarters the colonel and the general were in the colonel's tent and i took the stuff in and reported all the occurrences but where is the lady inquired the general after reading the letter and wiping his eyes as we were about to start back said i after taking the smuggled goods from her she gave her horse the whip and rode away i had no orders to shoot a woman and i let her go thank god said the general that's the best way said the colonel she will quit smuggling and go to her children eighteen months after the lady rode away from me leaving her quinine i was in new orleans to be mustered in as second lieutenant having received a commission i had bought me a fine uniform and thought i was about as cunning a looking an officer as ever was i was walking on canal street looking in the windows and finally went into a store to buy some collars a gentleman came in with a gray uniform on 
and one sleeve empty. He was evidently a Confederate officer. He asked me if I did not belong to a certain cavalry regiment, and if my name was not so-and-so. I told him he was correct. He told me there was a lady in an adjoining store that wanted to see me. I did not know a soul, that is, a female soul, in New Orleans, but I went in with him. Any lady that wanted to see me in my new uniform could see me. As we entered the store, a lady left two little girls and rushed up to me, threw her arms around my neck, and— Say, does a fellow have to tell everything when he writes a war history? Well, she was awfully tickled to see me, and she was my smuggler. The Confederate was her husband, and the children were hers. The officer was as tickled as she was, and they compelled me to go to their house to dinner, and I enjoyed it very much. We talked over the arrest of the female smuggler, and she said to her husband, Pa, it was an awfully embarrassing situation for me and this Yankee, but he treated me like a lady, and the only thing I have to find fault about is that he forgot to help me hook up my dress, and I rode clear to town with it unhooked. The Confederate had been discharged at the surrender, and I was on my way to Texas to serve another year hunting Indians. I left them very happy, and as I went out of their door, she wrapped his empty sleeve around her waist, drew the children up to her, and said, Mr. Yankee, may you always be very happy. End of chapter 12 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 13 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 The Female Smuggler Episode Makes Me Famous. It was not twenty four hours before the news spread all over my regiment, as well as several other regiments, that a certain corporal had captured a female smuggler while on picket had searched her on the spot, and found a large quantity of quinine and other articles, contraband of war, and there was a general desire to look upon the features of a man, not a commissioned officer, who had gall enough to search a female rebel, from top to toe, without orders from the commanding officer, and I was constantly being visited by curiosity seekers who wanted to know all about it. Of course it was not known that I had been ordered to do as I did, and they all wondered why I was not made an example of, and many privates, corporals, and sergeants wondered if they would get out of it so easily, if they should do as I did. There were a great many women passing through the lines, and I am sure many soldiers decided that the first woman who attempted to pass through would get searched. It was talked among the men and for a day or two a lady would certainly have stood a poor show to have rode up to a picket post with a pass to go outside. The soldiers had so long been away from female society that it would have been a picnic for them to have captured a suspicious-looking woman who was pretty. I was pointed out downtown as the man who captured the woman loaded with quinine, and women with rebel tendencies would look at me as though I was a bold, bad man that ought to be killed, and they acted as though they would like to eat me. But I tried to appear modest, and not as though I had done anything I was particularly proud of. The next evening the colonel sent for me and said he had got something for me to do that required nerve. I told him that my experience in putting down the rebellion had shown me that the whole thing required nerve, that I had been on my nerve until my nerves were pretty near used up, and I asked him if he couldn't let some of the other boys do a little of the nervous work. He said he had one more woman job that he would like to have me undertake. I was sick of the whole woman business, and told him I did not want to be aggravated any more, that arresting women and searching them was nothing but an aggravation, and I wanted to be let out. He said in this case I would not have to arrest anybody of the female persuasion, but that I would have to be arrested, and that it would be the greatest joke that ever was. I told him if there was any joke about it, he could count me in. 
then he went on to say that my success with the female smuggler had excited all the boys to emulate my deeds and they were all laying for a female smuggler and that he feared it wouldn't be safe for a woman to be caught on the picket line there had got to be a stop put to it and he and the general had thought of a scheme he said there was a corporal in one of the companies who had made his brags that he would arrest the first female that came to his picket post and search her for smuggled goods and they wanted to make an example of him he asked me if i wasn't something of a boxer and i told him for a light weight i was considered pretty good then he asked me if i could ride on a side saddle i told him i could ride anything from a hobby to an elephant he said that was all right and i would fill the bill then he went into details i was to go to the town with him and be fitted out with a riding habit of the female persuasion false hair side saddle and a bustle as big as a bushel basket that i was to ride out on a certain road where the corporal would be on picket with two men he would stop me and search me i was to cry and beg and all that but finally submit to be searched and after the corporal had got started to search me i was to haul off and give him one biff in the nose another if it was necessary to knock him down paste one of the men in the ear if he showed any impudence jump on my horse and come back to town and leave the corporal to find his mistake i didn't half like the idea of dressing up in such a masquerading costume but of course if i could help put down the rebellion that way it was my duty to do it and besides i had a grudge against that corporal anyway because he called me a j and a substitute and a drafted man when i came to the regiment the colonel took me to the residence of a lady friend who rode on horseback a good deal and as he let her into the secret she helped fix me up all i had to do was to remove my cavalry jacket and she put the dress on over my head i always supposed they put on these dresses the same as men put on pants by walking into them feet first but she said they went over the head i felt as though my pants were going to show but she gave me some instructions about keeping the dress down and i began to feel a good deal like a woman the dress fit me around the waist as though it was made for me and when it was all buttoned up in front i felt stunning she and the colonel made a bustle out of newspapers and a small sofa cushion of eiderdown was placed where it would do the most good after the dress was all fixed she got a wig and put it on my head and a hat with a feather in it and then pinned a veil on the hair so it reached down to my rosebud mouth then she took a powder arrangement and powdered my face put on a pair of long gauntlets which she usually wore and told me to look in the glass when i looked into the glass i almost fainted the deception was so good that it would have fooled the oldest man in the world the colonel said he was almost inclined to fall in love with me himself and he did put his arm around me and squeeze me but i didn't notice any particular feeling such as i did when his lady friend was fooling around me that was different well i was an inveterate smoker at that time so i took my pipe and a bag of tobacco and put it in a pocket of the dress and some matches and we went out of doors the colonel took my tiny number eight boot in his hand and tossed me lightly into the saddle then he mounted his own horse and we rode around the suburbs of the town so i could get used to the side saddle i got him to stop behind a fence and let me have a smoke out of my pipe and then i told him i was ready he gave me a pass and told me to go out on the road the corporal was on and if he let me pass out of the lines to go on to a turn in the road where a squad of our men were on a scout and to report to the officer in charge who would bring me in all right by another road but if the corporal attempted to search me to do as i had been told to do after i had knocked the corporal down if i would give a yell the officer who was outside would come and arrest us all and bring us to the headquarters where the colonel could reprimand the corporal etc i threw a kiss to the colonel and started out on the road it was about a mile to the picket post and i had time to reflect on my position this was putting down the rebellion at a great rate i was an ostensible female liable to be insulted at any moment 
but I would maintain the dignity of my alleged sex if I didn't lay up a cent. I put on a proud, haughty look, full of purity and all that, and as I neared the picket post I saw the corporal step out into the road, and as I came up he told me to halt. I halted and handed him my pass, but he said it was a forgery and ordered me to dismount. I turned on the water from my eyes and began to cry, but it run off the bad corporal like water off a duck. "'None of your sniveling around me,' said the vile man. "'Get down off that horse.' "'Sir,' I said, with well-feigned indignation, "'you would not molest a poor girl who has no one to defend her. Let me go, I prithee.' I had read that let me go i prithee in a novel and it seemed to me to be the proper thing to say though i couldn't hardly keep from laughing prithee nothing said the corporal what you got in that bustle said the corporal bustle i said blushing so you could have touched a match to my face why speak of such a thing in the presence of a lady i want you to let me go or i shall think you are real mean so now please mr soldier let me go and i smiled at him and winked with my left eye in a manner that ought to have paralyzed a marble statue oh what you giving us said the vile man get down off that horse and let me go through you for quinine do you hear i was afraid if he helped me down he would see my boots or pants which would be a giveaway so I gathered my dress in my hands and jumped down in pretty good shape. I had sparred with the corporal several times in camp, and I knew I could knock him out easy, and I made up my mind that the first indignity he offered I would just lamb him one. It was all I could do to keep from pasting him in the nose when I first landed on the ground, but I had a part to play and it would not do to go off half-cocked so i looked sad pouted my lips and wondered if he would kiss me and feel the beard where i had been shaved now shuck yourself said he do what i asked with apparent alarm peel said he as he put his hand on my back sir i said with my eyes flashing fire and my heart throbbing and almost bursting with suppressed laughter you are insolent I am a poor orphan, unused to contact with coarse men. I have been raised a pet, and no vile hand has ever been laid upon me until you just touched me. If you touch me, I shall scream. I shall call for help. What would you do, you wicked, naughty man? Unbutton, said he, as he pointed to my dress in front. Call for help and be darned. You are a smuggler, and I know it. Oh, my God, said I, with a stage accent, has it come to this? Am I to be robbed of all I hold dear by a common Yankee corporal? Has a woman no rights which are to be respected? Am I to be murdered in cold blood with all my sins upon my head? Oh, Mr. Man, give me a moment to utter a silent prayer. Oh, hush, said he, and hold up your hands. There ain't a-going to be any blood. All I want is to go through you for quinine. Spare me, I beseech you, I said, as I held up my hands and got in position to knock him silly the first move he made. I am no walking drug store. I am a good girl. Around my awful form I draw an imaginary circle. Step but one foot within that sacred circle, and on thy head I launch the curse of Rome, Georgia. Let up on this Shakespeare and get to business said the corporal as he reached up to my neck to unbutton the top button of my dress he was looking at my dress and wondering what he would find concealed within when i brought down both fists and took him with one in each eye with a force that would have knocked a mule down he fell backwards and gave a yell that could be heard a mile then one of his men started for me and i knocked him in the ear and he fell beside the corporal the other man was going to come for his share when the officer who had been stationed outside the lines rode up with his men and asked what was the matter. The soldier who was not hit said I had assassinated the corporal. The officer said that was wrong, and women who would go around killing off the Union Army with their fists ought to be arrested. Just then the corporal raised up on his elbow and tried to open two of the blackest eyes that ever were seen turning to the officer he said 
that woman is a smuggler and she struck me with a brick house ancient female said the officer looking at me and laughing why do you go around like a basem of destruction wiping out armies one man at a time you ought to be ashamed of myself and you should be muzzled don't call me a female said i in my natural hoarse voice that is something that i will not submit to the corporal looked up at me with one eye the other being almost closed from the effects of the fall of the brick house he looked as though he smelled woolen burning as the old saying is the officer said he guessed he would take us all to headquarters and inquire into the affair the corporal said that there was nothing to inquire into that this female came along and insisted on going outside the lines and when he asked her in a polite manner to show her pass she struck him down with a billy or some weapon she had concealed about her person you are not much of a liar either said i jumping onto my horse astraddle like a man the corporal looked at me as though he would sink but he maintained that he had done nothing that should offend the most fastidious female the corporal and his men mounted and we all started for headquarters i rode beside the officer and the corporal was right behind me after we had got started i pulled out my pipe filled it lit a match as soldiers usually do though it was quite unhandy and began to smoke as the tobacco smoke rolled out under my veil from the alleged rosebud mouth the scene was one that the corporal and most of the men had never thought of though the officer was on all right enough the corporal could hardly believe his eyes or one eye for the other one had gone closed i was a fine enough looking female as we rode through the regiment except the pipe which i puffed along just as though i had no dress on as we rode up to the colonel's tent it was noised around that a scout had captured a daring female rebel and she had almost killed a corporal and the whole regiment gathered around the colonel's tent what is the trouble corporal asked the colonel of my black-eyed friend well this woman wanted to go outside and when i objected she knocked me down with a rail off a fence and you offered her no indignity the colonel asked not in the least said the corporal then the colonel asked me to tell my story which i did the corporal said it was a lie but the other man whom i did not hit said i was right can you disrobe before these soldiers without getting off your horse asked the colonel looking at me i told him i could and he told me to proceed i pulled the hat and hair off first and appeared with my red hair clipped short then i threw the dress over my head and appeared in my cavalry pants all dressed except my jacket and cap which the colonel handed me having brought it from the house where i put on the dress i put on the jacket wiped the powder off my face and the colonel said it's that condemned raw recruit all the boys took in the transformation scene and then the colonel told them that he wanted this to be a lesson to all of them to let all women who came to the picket posts or anywhere who had passes alone and not think because one woman had been caught smuggling that all women were smugglers in fact he wanted every soldier to mind his own business then he dismissed us and we went to our quarters on the way the one-eyed corporal touched me on the arm and he said old man you played it fine on me but i will get even with you yet End of chapter 13. Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina. Chapter 14 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Military Attire about this time i received the greatest shock of the whole war i had prided myself upon my uniform that i had brought from home which was made by a tailor and fit me first rate it was of as good cloth and as well made as the uniforms of any of the officers and i was not ashamed to go out with a party of officers on a little evening tear because there was nothing about my uniform to distinguish me from an officer except the shoulder straps 
and many officers did not wear shoulder straps at all except on dress parade or inspection i took great pleasure in riding around town wherever the regiment was located looking wise and posing as an officer but the time came when my uniform which came with me as a recruit became seedy and badly worn and it was necessary to discard it and draw some clothing of the quartermaster that is a trying time for a recruit one day it was announced that the quartermaster sergeant had received a quantity of clothing and the men were ordered to go and draw coats pants hats shoes overcoats and underclothing as winter was coming on and the regiment was liable to move at any time something happened that i was unable to be present at the first forenoon that clothing was issued and when i did call upon the quartermaster sergeant there was only two or three suits left and they had been tumbled over till they looked bad i can remember now how my heart sank within me as i picked up a pair of pants that was left they were evidently cut out with a buzz saw and were made for a man that weighed three hundred i held them up in installments and looked at them holding them by the top as high as i could and the bottom of the legs of the pants laid on the ground the sergeant charged the pants to my account and then handed me a jacket a small one evidently made for a humpbacked dwarf the jacket was covered with yellow braid oh so yellow that it made me sick the jacket was charged to me also then he handed me some undershirts and drawers so coarse and rough that it seemed to me they must have been made of rope and lined with sandpaper then came an overcoat big enough for an equestrian statue of george washington with a cape on it as big as a wall tent the hat i drew was a stiff cheap shoddy hat as high as a tin camp kettle which was to take the place of my knobby soft felt hat that i had paid five dollars of my bounty money for the hat was four sizes too large for me then i took the last pair of army shoes there was and they weighed as much as a pair of anvils and had rawhide strings to fasten them with has any old soldier of the army ever forgotten the clothing that he drew from the quartermaster these inverted pots for hats the same size all the way up and the shoes that seemed to be made of sole leather and which scrape the skin off the ankles oh if this government ever does go to gehenna as some people contend it will some time it will be as a penalty for issuing such ill-fitting shoddy clothing to its brave soldiers who never did the government any harm i carried the lot of clothing to my tent feeling sick and faint the idea of wearing them among folks was almost more than i could bear to think of i laid them on my bunk and looked at them and died right there that hat was of a style older than methuselah oh i could have stood it all but the hat and pants and shoes but they killed me while i was looking at the layout and trying to make myself believe that my old clothes that i brought with me were good enough to last till the war was over though the seat of the pants and the knees and the sleeves of the coat were nearly gone an orderly came through the company and said the regiment would have a dismounted dress parade at sundown and every man must wear his new clothes ye gods that was too much if i could have had a week or ten days to get used to those new clothes one article at a time i could have stood it but to be compelled to put the pants and jacket shoes and hat on all at once was horrible to think of and if i had not known that a deserter was always caught and punished i would have deserted but the clothes must be put on and i must go out into the world a spectacle to behold believing that it is better to face the worst and have it over i put on the pants first if i could ever meet the army contractor who furnished those pants to a government almost in the throes of dissolution i would kill him as i would an enemy of the human race there was room enough in those pants for a man and a horse yes and a bale of hay there were no suspenders furnished to the men and how to keep the pants from falling from grace was a question but i got a piece of tent rope cut a hole in the waistband and run the rope around inside and tied it around my waist puckering the top of the pants at proper intervals 
when i think of those pants now after twenty-two years i wonder that i was not irretrievably lost in them i would have been lost if i had not stuck out at the top but when i looked at the bottoms of the pants i found at least a foot too much if i had tied the rope around under my arms or buttoned them to my collar button they would have been too long at the bottom i finally rolled them up at the bottom and they rolled clear up above my knees but how they did bag around my body there was cloth enough to spare to have made a whole uniform for the largest man in the regiment at that time i was a slim fellow that weighed less than a hundred and twenty-five pounds and there is no doubt i got the largest pair of pants that was issued in the whole union army i only had a small round mirror in my tent so i could not see how awfully i looked only in installments but to a sensitive young man who had always dressed well any one can see how a pair of such pants would harrow up his soul if the pants were too large you ought to have seen the jacket the contractor who made the clothes evidently took the measure of a monkey to make that jacket it was so small that i could hardly get it on the sleeves were so tight that the vaccination marks on my arm must have shown plainly the sleeves were too short and my hands and half my forearm riding outside the body was so tight that i had to use a monkey wrench to button it and then i couldn't breathe without unbuttoning one button it was so tight that my ribs showed so plain they could be counted i stuffed some pieces of grain sack in the shoes and got them on and tied them put on that awful hat the bugle sounded to fall in and i fell out of my tent towards the place of assembly with my carbine if we had been going out mounted i could have managed to hide some of the pants around the saddle if i could have got my shoes over the horse's back but to walk out among men stubbing my shoes against each other and interfering and knocking my ankles off was pretty hard the company was about formed when i fell out of my tent and when the men saw me they snickered right out i have heard a great many noises in my time that took the life out of me the first shell that i heard whistle through the air and shriek and explode caused my hair to raise and i was cold all up and down my spine the first flock of minnie balls that sang about my vicinity caused my flesh to creep and my heart's blood to stand still once i was near a sawmill when the boiler exploded and as the pieces of boiler began to rain around me i felt how weak and insignificant a small red-headed freckle-faced man is once i heard a girl say no when i had asked her a civil question and i was so pale and weak that i could hardly reply that i didn't care a continental whether she married me or not but i never felt quite so weak and powerless and ashamed and desperate as i did when i came out falling over myself and the men of my company snickered at my appearance the captain held his hand over his face and laughed i fell in at the left of my company and the captain went to the right and looked down the line and seeing my pants out in front about a foot he ordered me to stand back i stood back and he looked at the rear of the line and i stuck out worse behind and he made me move up finally he came down to where i was and told me to throw out my chest i tried to throw it out and busted a button off but the pressure was too great and my chest went back finally the captain told me i could go to the right of the company and act as orderly sergeant on dress parade he said as our company was on the right of the regiment they could dress on my pants and i wouldn't be noticed what i ought to have done was to have committed suicide right there but i went to the right trying to look innocent and we moved off to the field for dress parade everything went on well enough except that in coming to a carry arms with my carbine for my present the muzzle of the carbine knocked off my stiff hat and the stock of the carbine went into the pocket of my pants and run clear down my leg before i could rescue it a file closer behind me picked up my hat and put it on me with the yellow cord tassels in front and before i could fix it the order came first sergeants to the front and centre march 
those who are familiar with military matters know that at dress parade the first sergeants march a few paces to the front then turn and march to the centre of the regiment turn and face the adjutant and each salutes that officer in turn and reports company blank all present or accounted for that was the hardest march i ever had in all my army experience i knew that every eye of every soldier in the six companies at the right of the regiment would be on my pants and the officers would laugh at me and the several hundred ladies and gentlemen from town who were back of the colonel witnessing the dress parade would laugh too a man can face death in the discharge of his duty better than he can face the laughter of a thousand people i seemed to be the only soldier in the whole regiment who had not got a pretty good fit in drawing his new clothes but i was a spectacle as i marched to the front with the other eleven first sergeants and stood still for them to dress on me i felt as though the piece of tent rope with which i had fastened my large pants up was becoming untied and i began to perspire what would become of me if that rope should become untied if that rope gave way it seemed to me it would break up the whole army stampede the visitors and cause me to be court-martialed for conduct unbecoming any white man i made up my mind if the worst came i would drop my carbine and grab the pants with both hands and save the day at the command right and left face i turned to the left and i could feel the pants begin to droop as it were so i took hold of the top of them with my left hand and at the command march i started for the centre i had got almost past my own company and there had been no general laugh but when i passed an irishman named mulcahy i heard him whisper out loud to the man next to him howly jesus look at the pants then there was a snicker all through the company which was taken up by the next and by the time i got to the centre and front faced a half of the regiment were laughing and the officers were scolding the men and whispering to them to shut up just then i felt that the one hand that was trying to hold the pants up was never going to do the work in the world so i dropped my carbine behind me and said company e all present or accounted for and stood there like a stoughton bottle holding the waistband of those pants with both hands as pale as a ghost i could see that the adjutant and the colonel and two majors were laughing and many of the visitors were trying to keep from laughing i think i lived seventy years in five minutes while the other eleven orderlies were reporting and when the order came to return to our posts i whispered to the next orderly to me and told him if he would pick up my carbine and bring it along i would die for him and he picked it up the dress parade was soon finished but instead of marching the companies back to their quarters they were ordered to break ranks on the parade ground and for an hour i was surrounded with officers and men who laughed at me till i thought i would die the colonel and adjutant finally told me that it was a put-up job on me to make a little fun for the boys they said i had often had fun at the expense of the other boys and they wanted to see if i could stand a joke on myself and they admitted that i had done it well if i had known it was a joke i could have lived through it better the colonel said he had got a little work for me that evening and the next morning i could take my clothes downtown to the post quartermaster and exchange them for a suit that would fit me i went to his tent and he showed me a lot of company reports and wanted me to make out a consolidated monthly report for the assistant adjutant general of the brigade i had done some work for him before and he left me a blank signed by himself and colonel and told me to make out a report and send it to the brigade headquarters as he was going downtown with a party of officers i made up my mind that i would get even with the adjutant and the colonel so i took a pen and filled out the blank my idea was to put all the figures in the wrong column which i did and send it to the brigade headquarters the next morning i went downtown with the quartermaster and got a suit of clothes to fit me and on the way back to camp i passed brigade headquarters when i saw our adjutant looking quite dejected he called to me and said he had been summoned to brigade headquarters to explain some inaccuracies in the monthly report sent in the night before 
and he wanted me to stay and see what was the trouble but i acted as though if there was a mistake it was an error of the head rather than of the feet pretty soon the old brigade adjutant who was a strict disciplinarian and a man who never heard of a joke came in from the general's tent with his brow corrugated they had evidently been brooding over the report i beg your pardon adjutant said he with a preoccupied look but in your report i observe that your regiment contains forty-three enlisted men and nine hundred and twenty-six company cooks this seems to me improbable and the general cannot seem to understand it the adjutant turned red in the face and was about to stammer out something when the adjutant general continued again we observe that your quartermaster has on hand nine hundred bales of condition powders which is placed in your report as rations for the men that you have only eleven horses in your regiment fit for duty that you have the same number of men while the commissioned officers foot up at nine hundred and twenty six of your sick men there seems to be plenty some eight hundred which would indicate an epidemic of which these headquarters had not been informed previously in the column headed officers detailed on other duty i find four six mule teams and one spike team of five mules in the column officers absent without leave i find the entry all gone off on a drunk this sir is the most incongruous report that has ever been received at these headquarters from a reputably sober officer can this affair be satisfactorily explained at once or would you prefer to explain it to a court-martial captain said the adjutant in distress and perspiring freely my clerk has made a mistake and placed a piece of waste paper that has been scribbled on in the envelope instead of the regular report let me take it and i will send the proper report to you in ten minutes the adjutant general handed over my report after asking how it happened that the signature of the colonel and adjutant was on the ridiculous report and the adjutant and the red-headed recruit went out mounted and rode away on the way the adjutant said i ought to kill you on the spot but i won't you have only retaliated on us for playing them pants on you i hate a man that can't take a joke then we made out a new report and i took it to headquarters and all was well but the adjutant was not as kitteny with his jokes on the other fellows for many moons end of chapter fourteen recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina